There are some stories which will not only an audience do, but may become their participants. Nikki's story came out by accident after this scrapbook surfaced after gathering dust for decades. Once it did, though, it said about a whole chain of incredible events. That's me before I left for England. But until 1988, I had no idea who had rescued me from all but certain death. It was this old man who had saved my life and that of hundreds of others in the Second World War. Yet for 50 years, we knew nothing about him, not even that he existed. I think there's much too much harping in the past. Quite frankly, I can't see the point of all that. We've never learned anything from the past. I think the future lies in forgetting the past, not remembering it. It started with Adolf Hitler instilling hatred in Germans from childhood up for everything he considered foreign. Most of all, for Jews, Gypsies and Slavs. And he used the hate he had whipped up to prepare his nation for war. You could hear Hitler's voice raving on the radio, and you could feel the danger getting closer and closer and closer. We were seven-year-old children in second grade, and one day, a girl comes up to me and slaps me on the face left and right and left and right, and she said, my father told me to do that. So I was stunned, I was flabbergasted. How can she do that? I was only about um, four or five years old, but I hit my head on a central heating radiator and I cut my head open. And I remember my father taking me to the doctor and the doctor looked at it and he said, uh, that, that does need stitching, but I don't stitch Jews. The hatred coming from Germany didn't just endanger Jews, but also the Czechs as well. They turned out to protest Hitler's demands for a chunk of their country, the so-called Sudeten borderlands. The Czechs mobilized to defend themselves, but they needed help from their allies in the West. Neither in Britain, nor for that matter in any other democracy, was there any great will to confront Hitler and risk war. So the British and French prime ministers went to Munich and ended up signing a humiliating deal with Hitler. The word Munich has ever since then stood for cowardly appeasement. At the time though, when Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain returned here to Parliament and waved that piece of paper he brought back from Munich and declared it to have brought peace for a time, a wave of relief swept through most of Europe. But not in Czechoslovakia, of course. We uh, lived in Sudetenland, this town of Pobjevice, which is near to the border of Germany. It all happened so suddenly. My mother took us four children. We didn't manage to uh, take anything at all. We just uh, ran for our lives. This was frightening for children. I remember standing in front of a shop window where there was a map of uh, Czechoslovak Republic. And in a black ink was marked in the part which was handed over to Hitler. And there were people all around the shop making all kinds of bad remarks and says, well, we can't do that, we will fight, and we will fight, and we will fight. I remember the following day loading all our few belongings, there weren't too much, on a horse and cart, and uh, 
We were out of there. My, my parents, my brother and I, and at the time I was just six years old, we had no clue what was going on. There was a new refugee here in our class. And I was most surprised to see that she had no shoes on her feet. When break came, I ran across the road and took out of my wardrobe my best shoes and brought them to her. I told mother what had happened. Tears appeared on her face and she hugged me. And she said, you did the right thing, my little girl. The first pages of the scrapbook and of our story came to be written in December 1938. You look at the pictures and the list of all of us, and you have to wonder, what made a 29-year-old Englishman do such a thing? In a way, what Whitten did was surprising. The world was his oyster. In the depth of the Great Depression, his job as a stockbroker allowed him to enjoy the good life. He was a champion fencer who also loved to sail, to ski, and to travel. In 1938, with Christmas approaching, Winton had his mindset on going to Switzerland for a skiing holiday. In other words, he wasn't exactly the kind of young man you'd normally associate with a passion for altruism. At least not until that phone call that changed his life, my life, and the life of so many others. Hello? The phone call was from Prague from Martin Blake, a friend with whom Nicky had planned to go on that skiing trip. Blake said he couldn't make it because he had gone to Czechoslovakia to help people in trouble with the Germans. So Nicky decided to forget the ski trip and join Blake to take a look at what was going on there. I went to Prague with the background knowledge of people in England who felt they knew much more about what Hitler was up to than the present government. The first thing I did then was to, to go around the camps where all those people endangered by the Nazis were living. To miss some huts with one little stove in the middle, and the conditions were pretty terrible. It was very cold, snow on the ground. A lot of the refugees were really in very bad shape. They felt that the days were numbered before the Germans were going to arrive in Czechoslovakia. But how could they save themselves? What could they do? Where should they go? They were stuck. While Winton was in Prague, he was given a map that shook him up. He showed the map, a map of German plans and ambitions for territorial expansion to France. And what it showed was that the Germans had ambition to take over the whole of Europe. Nobody had believed it. There were many other people, refugees like us, small children. There was a fire, smoke from cooking and heating. And uh, I was, I remember being given something hot because it was cold weather then. The desperation was not just among the poor in the camps, in Prague and elsewhere. 
anxious parents, having heard about this concerned Englishman, headed for Winton's Hotel. Well, I didn't get much sleep when I was at the Schrobeck. I got to bed very late, and there were people knocking at my door in the morning. I saw those people who were in difficulty, in danger, people on Hitler's backlist for whom there was nobody to help. And I thought, at least I ought to try and save the children. Everybody in Prague said, look, there is no organization to deal with the children. We can't deal with them. Anyway, nobody will let the children in on their own. But if you want to have a go, have a go. And <clears throat> I have a motto that if something isn't blatantly impossible, there must be a way of doing it. So he started writing letters here, there, and everywhere, asking for help. And he had no hesitation about going right to the top, writing to the White House, to President Franklin Roosevelt. A few weeks later, he got a reply. Not from the White House, though, but from much lower down on the diplomatic food chain, from this building here in London, right behind me the American Embassy. And the reply said, the United States government is unable to permit immigration in excess of that provided for by existing laws. But Winton wasn't about to let this stop him. He and his helpers started making up the list of children without actually knowing whether they would be able to help them. Well, this is the cafe that I came down every day. I was sitting there for more than about two minutes before the first people came to talk to me and find out how they could get their children to England. And this went on the whole time I was here. The picture must be of good quality. As word of his campaign spread, it drew the attention of the Germans. They suspected that Nicky Winton's efforts were about something more than just getting out a few children. They decided they needed to get closer to him, which they did, using one of the oldest tricks in the spy business, the lure of a beautiful woman. They met, as if by chance, at the Hotel Schrobeck. Nikki was enchanted, and not just by her beauty. Her name, she said, was Kirsten, and she was the Prague representative of the Swedish Red Cross. I dare say she was very beautiful. I mean, traditional for a spy to be beautiful, isn't it? You can't have an ugly spy. It's a contradiction in terms. Kerstin told him she had permission to bring refugee children to Sweden. Witten's hopes soared. Finally, a chance, perhaps, to get some children out. Friends warned him that she was a known Nazi spy. Nikki forged ahead anyway and kept on seeing her. And it paid off. Kirsten got 25 children admitted to Sweden. In fact, she flew off to Sweden with them and disappeared from Nikki's life completely.
My parents tried every, every way to get us out of Czechoslovakia. We tried to get to America. We tried to get to England. We tried to get to Palestine. But all the governments said our, our borders are now closed. My mother got up every day at four o'clock and went to stand in the queues of different consulars for getting papers for Uruguay and some other un unmentionable places. And uh, there was no way out. We knew that the timing was absolutely essential to do everything now and quickly. The number of children who were in urgent need of leaving the country for safety was certainly over 2,000. Winton kept on meeting with the families, working on a list of children. Then suddenly, his work was threatened by a phone call from London. The call was from his boss. My boss from the Stock Exchange didn't think that what I was doing in Prague was important. He didn't think what I was doing in Prague was necessary. He said, why do you want to stay in Czechoslovakia and help those far off people that people don't know anything about. He was just a money chap on the stock exchange, completely non-humanitarian, with bags of money, and all he thought about was money. Winton, to the relief of his co-workers, decided to defy his boss and stay in Prague. No, I'm telling you, it's important. Nicky Winton's efforts came to the ears of all those who had decided that to send their children away, that my father also approached this uh, refugee committee. My mother took me to the Winton office on Rubeshova Ulice. We stood in line on a winding staircase for hours till my turn came and I was registered. Parents exchanged their hopes and fears, and we children eyed each other for potential friends. You had all these refugees who were fleeing from Hitler and who were in uh, danger of their lives if Hitler made another move into Czechoslovakia. It was the day the Germans occupied Prague. There was convoys approaching. Germans with motorcycles in front, with sidecars. And, and behind them, there were the big trucks, open trucks, with soldiers seated on, in two rows. The people on the street were screaming at them. Women were crying. Finally, a very large uh, Mercedes drove past. Hitler standing there with his ha arm raised, with three officers sitting behind. It was so quiet, it was like if you could hear a pin drop. As soon as Hitler came in, so a Nazi officer came to our school and said, who are the Jewish children? And another child and I put the hand up. So he said, now all oh, you sit at the back. The Jewish children sit at the back. When he went out, the headmaster came in and he said, from now on, the back seat is the seat of honor. Only, only the best children sit there. That was Czechoslovakia. Winton wrote all over looking for countries to take in his children. Only one responded positively, his own country, Britain. The rest of the world closed its eyes, its ears, its hearts, and its gates.
Winton started his work in London from scratch. There was no organization, no existing pipeline, and he was convinced that time was running out, that war was about to come. From this house on Hampstead Heath, Winton conducted his campaign to get the Germans to let the children out, the British Home Office to let them in, to find British families to take them into their homes, and to raise the money to make it all possible. One of the chief problems was people said that the English government would never allow children in on their own without their parents. I asked the Home Office and they said yes. And they gave me certain conditions which were difficult. I had to find a family which would look after the child until the emergency was over. And each child had to have a guarantor of 50 pounds. It was a hell of a lot of money. When I say the committee in London, it was me and a secretary working from home. I mean, we had no office. We weren't an official body at all. So all I had to do was to buy some notepaper and print British Committee of Refugees from Czechoslovakia, children's section. <laughs> And then I had the police round and asking me why I had so much correspondence with Prague. The situation in Prague was serious. There was active menacing hostility from the Germans. When Hitler came, when the Germans occupied Czechoslovakia, I had to leave school. We couldn't go to the movie, we couldn't go to, to the opera, to concerts, everything was forbidden. Father was driving along with the Karlovo Namnesti, and they saw that the Gestapo had made an action there, and they were taking people out and putting them onto a truck. Every family was scared. Which family was not scared? Every family was scared. Whenever my father left for the office in the morning, my mother was terribly upset and quite often cried because she was so worried that he might never come home again, being arrested by the Germans. My father was a wanted person, and he was warned to leave. A few days later, the Gestapo did come to look for him. They took my mother away for questioning. Well, I was beginning to pick up tension and worry in the grown-ups. My uncle and his wife committed suicide. And then the next day, um, someone came to our house and said, Bruno's burning. And so I was terrified of fire. That was the day then that there were three, four synagogues burnt down to the ground. As the despair of the parents grew, so did the pressure on Winton, with photographs of applicants continuing to flow in. A simple snapshot could often decide the fate of a child. We received the pictures of the children from Prague with details of each child. We enlisted these pictures in the local press, the national press, in Picture Post, which was a journal which helped us enormously. What made Winton so effective was that in addition to his skills as a salesman, he also had a creative spark and a willingness to experiment.
And we put six or oh. eight of these children together on one card, merely to speed up the process of getting the British families to choose. If somebody said, we'd like to take a child, we just said, with what sex? And then we said, what age? We gave them pictures of half a dozen children. And then we asked them to choose a child, which was uh, rather a commercial way of dealing with it. But it was quick and effective, and it worked. And in most cases, it went right. When somebody wanted to take a child, say they were up in Newcastle from London, which is a long way away, uh, we got somebody in Newcastle to vet the family to see that the family was okay. We were sitting around a little table, you know, having supper, but mother wasn't eating, and suddenly she put her knife and fork down and looked far at father and said very quietly, I heard today that both Eva and Vera can go to England. And my father looked up and there were tears in his eyes. And as he said, we'll have to let them go. There was a lot of sadness in the house and uh, also um, sort of a peculiar atmosphere. My father looked sad. My mother obviously was devastated. One day I remember my father called me and he said, you're going on a long journey. You're going um, to a country called England. We can't come with you. The pressure from the parents was incredible. We in London at that time uh, thought that uh, there was going to be a catastrophe at any moment. And for us, time was absolutely essential. We cut all kinds of corners. Even having fake passports or travel documents made at some time, because the Home Office was a bit slow. But it was a forgery to bamboozle the Germans, really, not to bamboozle the British. We didn't bring anybody in illegally. We just uh, speeded the process up a little. My mother, with a friend of hers, took me to the station. And I can still see the tension on my mother's face. Looking anxious. There were German soldiers with a swastika standing nearby. Lots of other parents seeing their children off. And a clear sense of tension, which even a six-year-old child felt. My mom. She is crying so hard, and, and uh, she was hysterical. And she's asking us over and over, are you sure you want to go? Are you sure you want to go? I'm frustrated. Why is my mother crying like that? I've never seen her like that. Transport was due to leave. I'd get a message from the Germans. We can't let the transport go unless you give us so much more money. So they were terrible. You just had to find the money. I mean, it was an egg you couldn't unscramble anymore. 
There's no way you can cancel a big operation like that. thing my dad said to me was I should be his brave, cheerful little girl. And I think I have been. And he said, see you soon. My mother was beside herself. My little sister was crying. My mother wanted to hold her. She took my sister through the open window of the train. We kept on uh, telling my mother to keep her, keep her, keep her, when she took her out of the window. And she held her. I know how, how much she suffered, really. I can just visualize it. It just makes me cry when I think, think about it. <laughs> Today, if you have to realize the sacrifice our parents did for us, they, they didn't know who they, where they were sending this to. It was the courage of our parents to send their children away. Then the next day, when we were crossing Germany, we were passing through these railway stations bedecked with uh, Nazi flags, uniforms. Then there were big portraits of Hitler and the swastikas everywhere. We arrived uh, at the German border. There were uh, lots of uh, Germans uh, crowding around and we wondered what was going to happen. There was something very frightening about the way they walked into the cabin, looked at our luggage. It was a feeling that there was going to be trouble. We were terrified that they would do something like maybe arrest us. We didn't know. I mean, we had the biggest fears. We were dumbfounded. But uh, finally they got off and we were delighted. We breathed a sigh of relief. We finally did reach the Channel Coast and boarded a ship, and the ship just seemed huge to me because the only ships I'd ever seen before in my life were the little paddle steamers that went up and down the Danube in Bratislava. And being little boys, we were fascinated by the ship and looking around, climbing up, up and down gangways and just running along all over the place. It was fun to go on a boat. I'd never been on a big boat <laughs> to cross the channel. 
That night, as we crossed the English Channel, suspended for a few hours in the calmness of the ship rocking us to sleep, I heard voices from nearby cabins singing the Czech national anthem. Dedom of Mui, Dedom of Mui. Where is my home? Where is my home? It was a question that remained unanswered for many of us for years. A question that for a few remains unanswered to this day. Liverpool Street Station. This is where we arrived in London. It's all changed, of course, except for all the noise. What I remember most is one of those little odd facts that stick in your mind your whole life, and that is getting off the train, that you didn't have to climb down to the rails as you did in Central Europe, that the platform was even with the train door, and all you had to do was just step out. I was very, very impressed. Liverpool Street Station saw the arrival of another group of refugee children. Another piteous cargo thrown overboard by the ruthless code of the modern European temper. A special effort is being made to help the refugees on Mother's Day. Then the train arrived and you had to, up to 200, 250 children getting out. And you had to get the right child to the right family. and you had to treat it as a business. You, when you got the right child with the right family, the family had to sign for the child so that you had some proof of delivery. They assembled us kids in the corner. There were a bunch of grown-ups waiting behind a barrier, craning their necks, waiting to pick us up. A lady behind the wooden table called my name, Ben Abeles. A lady my mother's age came over, embraced me, and kissed me. I remember when I arrived, having this uncomfortable string round my neck and a big placard on my chest, and I just was totally alone with nobody around me. And I was obviously waiting for the family who I was going to, to pick me up. And I was just three, three years old. There's bound to be troubles and difficulties some children got left behind and the police looked after them until we could sort things out. It was fairly chaotic, but it, uh, it worked out. There were five boys sitting on suitcases, waiting for somebody to pick us up. Nobody picked us up. It was late at night and uh, a taxi driver came over and asked us, have you been here since seven o'clock in the morning? Are you hungry? And he drove us not far away from the station to a fish and chip shop. Later, he took us to, to his own uh, wife and small child in a single bedroom apartment in which he uh, put us up, uh, the five of us. English as a people, as a people, uh, are extremely kind. And um, I would say the, uh, the, the poorer they were, the kinder they were. And we all were ushered into a big hall and there were hundreds of the children. And I was left sitting there trembling at the knees and suddenly the door opened and little lady ran towards me laughing 
and smiling at the same time, with tears streaming down her face as well, and she hugged me. Mr. and Mrs. Nam, the family that took us in, they were Methodists, farmers in Redgrave in um, Suffolk, East Anglia. Their cottage had a thatched roof. I'd never seen a thatched roof. My cousin and I went around the walls knocking. We were afraid it may fall down. <laughs> and for instance, the toilet was outside. There was no electricity. And they were good to us. They were true Christians in the real sense of the word. And the only people who uh, objected to what I was doing was when one day uh, a couple of rabbis arrived at home mm -hmm. and said that they understood that uh, some of the good Jewish children I was bringing over to this country were going to Christian homes, and that must stop. And I said, well, it won't stop, and if you prefer a dead Jew in uh, Prague to a live one who is being brought up in a Christian home, I said, that's your problem, not mine. As the months passed, we knew the end was nearing, and so he kept on pressing even harder for permits for more children. I mean, there were thousands of children on the lists who wanted to get out. We had organized eight transports from Prague. No transport completed the operation. I mean, it was an operation without end. From the beginning of September, we had arranged our biggest transport, which would have comprised 250 children. All the paperwork was done, all the uh, families were prepared to take the children, all the children were waiting in the train. Auf Anordnung des Reichsprotektors in Böhmen und Mähren wird der zwischenstaatliche Eisenbahnverkehr mit sofortiger Wirkung eingestellt. greatest regret was that our biggest transport, which was 250 children, which was due to leave at the beginning of September, was cancelled because war started. I was in London. We watched the planes coming over, dropping bombs. I remember the houses fell down like cards or domino sticks, just collapsed. During the Battle of Britain, bombs were raining down on us every night. I was then an apprentice cook at the Bailey's Hotel in London as a dishwasher and a pot washer. And uh, every night, practically, we ended up in the air raid shelter. My mother wrote us long letters. It, my dearest children, I'm ha very happy that you are over there and don't know about evil. All Jews under 50 here must work in labor camps. We will come through somehow, and you mustn't worry about us. But I'm very happy that you are not here. We learned about the concentration camps and the possibility that our parents might have been taken to them. We all hope that nothing awful happened to them, that they were well. The last letter from my father came in 1942. He wrote that they had received orders to pack up, that they were being transported somewhere else, and in which he sort of wrote to his sons, telling them not to forget the precepts they were taught at home. And he hoped the Almighty would allow us to grow up into just and decent men. 
And that was the last thing I heard from my parents. Nothing that happened prior to the war starting was really of any importance anymore. What was done was done, what couldn't be done couldn't be done, what had been done was done. Once you can't stop a war and there is a war, you, I suppose, go to the defense of your country and I joined the RAF. to go to town to see how everybody was celebrating. And uh, Trafalgar Square, I remember in London, where everybody went around putting up their two V for victory. Everybody laughed. That was uh, so gay. Uh, we were dancing with American soldiers. The war was over but still no news of our families. Many of us came back to Czechoslovakia to look for them. I came to Prague, here to this building behind me, which served as a clearinghouse for separated families. Inside, wall upon wall filled with notices put up by people looking for their missing loved ones. Of my parents, though, not a trace. I know they were deported to Poland, but to this day, I'm not certain how they came to die. My first stop in Prague was the house from which my parents were deported to Terezin. There was a minimal chance that they would have come back. I lingered for a while as if I were waiting for them to appear suddenly. But in vain. My mother and my brother, together with about 10 and other children, arrived to Auschwitz and were sent to the gas chamber. An old friend of the family who took care of the dead bodies immediately recognized my mother. He told her, please take your children, go in, sit down in the corner and start to sing with them. Because if you sing and you inhale the gas, you will die very quickly.
when my parents went to concentration camps and when they saw other children around them, young boys and the girls being taken to gas chambers and so forth, that they must have then They must have then realized what they, what they had done. When they sent the children. family, my parents, none of these people survived. So after the war, we had to continue living to overcome the past. We were all young. We were beginning. Uh, we had to build careers. When you're young, you take everything in life, including survival, for granted. As I grew older, though, I began to wonder more and more how it was that when so many died, our parents, friends, families, and millions of others, how it came to be that we fortunate few on those trains from Prague were spared. That is, until 50 years later, when this scrapbook surfaced. The scrapbook and its story gathered dust for decades in the Winton's attic, until one day, Nicky's wife Greta found it, opened it, became fascinated, and yet was puzzled. And so 50 years after it happened, Nicky Winton finally told his wife what he had for so long kept secret. And uh, his wife went to London and she tried to uh, give this story to several people, but nobody was interested until she came to me. I was given the scrapbook and uh, this list of names and I thought it was very moving because they were ordinary names of uh, people and uh, Czech children. For instance, Berman Thomas, Bekefi Jiri, Benedict Ruth, and we wrote to every one of them. And from these uh, over 600 uh, names, we got 250 answers and most of the children were delighted. They did not know who had saved them and they did not know their own story. It caught the eye of uh, Esther Ranson, who was working for the BBC. So we did some research and we managed to track down some of those children, now adults, living in England. We were absolutely thrilled. This lady said to me, what's your name? So uh, I said, Pinkasovich. When I saw my name and my brother's name printed, it is the biggest shock of my life. I couldn't speak, I couldn't breathe. Uh, I had goosebumps all on my arms. All these years, 50 years, Nobody knew who masterminded our rescue. And then out of the blue, I was asked to take part in a television show, That's Life, where to my joy and, oh, such fulfillment, I came to face, face to face, with the man who saved my life. They got me there in a way under false pretenses. Well, then I was sat on earth a seat which was focused on the camera and... I became part of this program that I didn't know. I was going to meet for the first time the children that I'd brought over so many years before. He managed to save 664 children. This is his scrapbook. There are all kinds of fascinating pictures in it. Perhaps you can see this is a picture of Nicholas Winton himself with one of the children he rescued. If you look at the very back of this scrapbook, fascinating things in it, all the letters, 
Back here is the list of all the children. This is Vera Diamant, now Vera Gissing. We did find her name on his list. Vera Gissing is with us here tonight. Hello, Vera. And uh, I should tell you that you are actually sitting next to Nicholas Winton. Hello. <laughs> I wore this around my neck, and this is the actual pass that we were given to come to England. And I'm another of the children that you saved. Can I ask, is there anyone in our audience tonight who owes their life to Nicholas Winton? If so, could you stand up, please? The handkerchief I'm holding goes back to 1939. My mother saw me off on a kinder transport from Prague and she took a handkerchief out of her bag in order to wipe my tears at our goodbyes. I knew I would never see my parents again. And I have kept this handkerchief newly laundered ever since. I'm glad that I've shared my stories for the sake of being recorded for posterity. Sadly, I don't think the world has learned lessons from the past. Everybody has to learn to live with everybody else, regardless of creed or religion. I never thought what I did 70 years ago was going to have such a big impact as apparently it has. And uh, if it has now got a story which uh, helps people to live uh, for the future, well, that will be an added bonus.